Welcome in, Packer fans. Welcome to the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. That certainly did not go according to plan, or I think as really any of us expected it to. Um, I'll certainly take ownership. I definitely thought that the Packers would win that game. Um, like I said uh, in the preview show yesterday, it didn't really matter to me if it was by one point or whatever, or more than that. I just thought they would end up with the win, but that that did not go anywhere near according to plan. And of course, the New Orleans Saints completely obliterated and outplayed the Green Bay Packers for four quarters in three phases. They outworked them. They outhustled them, outhearted them. They outplayed them. They outplayed them on offense, defense, special teams. There is no two ways about it. And you can't point to anything else. Like Green Bay went in there, whether it was overconfident or just not prepared. I don't know. Uh, insert your own conclusion there, but completely and utterly embarrassed. There's no other way to put it. I think Matt LaFleur used that same word as well, but they were utterly embarrassed in Jacksonville against the Saints. And we're going to get into a lot of things. And let me first, I guess, start by saying we talked about this yesterday. For those of you who listened on the video uh, yesterday, I said the very first thing that I was looking at was the line of scrimmage. It was the one area where I thought New Orleans really had some area of advantage. I thought their offensive line could potentially keep the Packers defensive line in front, you know, really front seven at bay. And I thought there was the potential that maybe Cam Jordan, Marcus Davenport and company could get some pressure on Aaron Rodgers and maybe at least slightly win that matchup as well. Yes, it was very much arguably the most important factor that ended up being in that game. No, I never expected it to be quite that bad. I went back and rewatched the game on Rewind. The Saints' defensive front was definitely better than the Packers' offensive front, not like to an extreme extent. There were definitely a couple plays. The Rodgers interception where he threw behind Adams. Uh, Royce Newman got completely obliterated on that play, uh, just completely beat clean uh, by, by, I believe it was Cam Jordan. So that was a big play. They couldn't really get anything going running the ball. I don't think they were terrible, the Packers offensive line, but if you watch it, their their front was consistently encroaching upon the Packers. Like they were pushing the Packers offensive line back and back into Aaron Rodgers and again gave no running lanes when the very few and far but you know far between times where the Packers actually tried to run the football. On the flip side though, the Saints offensive line completely manhandled the Packers front, especially in the first half. In the second half, the Packers defense got it together a little bit, like a little bit when it was really far too late at that point anyway. But you go back and especially in that second quarter, but in the first half as a whole, the Saints offensive line, there were Packers on the ground, hands on their hips. Like they they were just completely knocked backwards off the line of scrimmage. You talk about wanting to reset the line of scrimmage. The Saints were consistently and constantly resetting the line of scrimmage. And there was everything that went wrong in this game, right? So like the offense played bad. There were multiple turnovers. They couldn't convert on third downs. The Saints consistently converted on third downs. But as I mentioned yesterday, more often than not, games boil down to the trenches. And it's not always fun. It's not always sexy. It's not always the most exciting, but watch early in games to see who's dominating the line of scrimmage. And if it's close or if there's, you know, wins and losses here or there, all right, then you kind of go to the, the secondary stuff. But if there's one team that's massively controlling the line of scrimmage, that team's going to win more often than not. And the Saints dominated the line of scrimmage. The Packers defensive front has to play better. So I think to me, that was the biggest issue, but like, you can you can pin anything you want, right? And and just legitimately preparedness and effort. You could you know pinpoint as as the other top things that were that went into the equation because the the Saints were well prepared. They were extremely motivated. They wanted to outplay the Packers, and not only did they outplay them, they embarrassed them. Now there are a variety of things that I want to go over that I think are some level of frustration in this game. The first is though specifically on the defensive side of the ball, the Packers had some options. And I don't want to jump to conclusions here, right? This is game one. That is, We still have a full 16 game regular season, which is the usual regular season left. A ton of time, the NFC North is 0-4. The Packers will get the majority of this stuff figured out. 
As you know, I watch every player on every play, grade every player on every play, and take a painstaking approach to reviewing and analyzing which players are playing well and which players are playing poorly. Earlier this offseason, I went on a, a limb, I guess, or at least I, I was pretty adamant in the fact that I thought out of Kevin King, Dean Lowry, Tyler Lancaster, Preston Smith, maybe one of those guys would be back on a cheaper deal. But I very vehemently said I thought those guys would be gone. I didn't think Green Bay would bring them back. And I thought that it was time to move on, that these players have put more bad on tape over the last couple seasons than good. Now, Preston Smith, good 2019, bad 2020, but the bad 2020 was really bad. Tyler Lancaster, Dean Lowry haven't been net positives in years. Kevin King has really never been a net positive. It was time to move on. If you look at these contracts, Kevin King ends up getting six million. Dean Lowry, they restructure his you know contract and, and end up paying him uh, money that they didn't have to pay if they decided to move on. Tyler Lancaster was basically a minimum, but they still could have used that money elsewhere. And Preston Smith, they restructure his deal so that he ends up getting more money. Well, in the end, more money than if he would have been released. Right? There's a big chunk of money there where if you move on from those four players, you can go out and make a serious investment on a player or two that could potentially come in and help your defense. Instead, they decided to keep it the status quo. And at the end of the day, what it feels like, and I posted this on Twitter, is that the the Packers had this floundering restaurant, their defense, that was getting poor reviews. They had these specific ingredients. Some ingredients were good. Some were not as good. People weren't really a fan of it. And they said, you know what? We're going to keep the ingredients at this restaurant the same, but we're going to bring in a new chef. We're going to fire the old chef. We're going to bring in a new chef. But oh, by the way, the chef that we're bringing in, the reviews from his restaurant at his last two restaurants he'd been at weren't really all that good either. But we think he's learned some new tricks, but we're going to keep the same ingredients in place. At the end of the day, the restaurant looks like it's still not getting the greatest reviews, right? Maybe it's a poor analogy for the fact that the Packers have kept all of their same defensive players, save for basically Devondre Campbell for Christian Kirksey and decided to go with a new defensive coordinator. And that was going to be their major change. They thought that Dean Lowry, Tyler Lancaster, Kenny Clark, and Kingsley Kiki up front could hold it down. They thought Preston and Z and Gary could get pressure on the edge. They thought Chris Barnes and Devondre Campbell at inside linebacker were enough. They thought the same three corners, Kevin King, Shannon Sullivan, Jair Alexander were good at corner. And then Savage and Amos with Henry Black being the, the next safety up. They thought that that was a enough ingredients for success. Week one in the books, that certainly does not seem to be the case. And those same players, now Preston, I actually thought at, at first glance had a good game. I went back and rewatched. He, he played well early, seemed to maybe wear down as the game get, went on. I'll look at it more when I watch the L22. But Kevin King beat deep again, very similar to the Scotty Miller play against Tampa a season ago. I got turned around early in the game on a first down completion. Dean Lowry and Tyler Lancaster consistently displaced along the line of scrimmage and certainly were not coming close to making plays at or behind the line of scrimmage. The same issues that presented itself at times over the last few seasons presented themselves on defense again. And I think that is a major cause for concern and something that the Packers are going to have to figure out. Offensively, I have a major issue with how this offense and specifically Matt LaFleur has called the offense when they've been behind. And I basically relate it to being on tilt at a poker table. And for those of you who aren't familiar, basically it's you lose a big hand at a poker table. And now the very next hand, regardless of whether you've been dealt good cards or not, you get in that next hand because you want to win the money back that you just lost. And you push a bunch of chips in to try to win. And somebody else has got a better hand because you're just playing a crappy hand because you want to win your money back. And then you lose that one. And then the next one comes around and now you're all in with an even crappier hand because you want to win the last two hands that you had uh, just lost back. And then you end up back at the ATM machine and you are quickly spiraling out of control. It's, it's called being on tilt, and that's very much how I feel this Packers offense operates when they get down, even by a score, but specifically by multiple scores. All of the run fakes, the play actions, the jet sweeps, the just running the football, all of it goes out the window, and you're now lining up five wides and trying to just throw at the opposing team, letting them tee off on a young offensive line, and so on and so forth. And it's been a recipe for disaster. And this is, it's worth saying now, like 
Matt Lafleur has been fantastic, right through two, through two plus seasons. I, I don't. I'm not. I'm not, you know, dragging Matt LaFleur. I think he's been fantastic, truly. But it is odd now. There are five games, you know, in two plus seasons, what, 18, 36, 37. So five out of 37 games that the Packers have just completely no-showed for. Five games in 37. Basically one out of every seven games. And maybe I'm not doing that math right, but it feels about right. Um, because what 14 and 4 is 18, 14 and 4 is 18, so 36, 37 games he's coached in, right? And there's been five games, so five times seven, 35. All right, I'm doing my math right. I don't know my abacus, it's way too late here, but basically, one out of that is has been a complete no show. They had the game against the 49ers in 2019 in the regular season, the game against the Chargers in 2019 in the regular season, the game against the 49ers in the NFC Championship game, nonetheless. Then they had the game against Tampa Bay in the regular season last year. And now they had this game against the Saints in week one this year. That is five times where the Packers have simply not showed up to the game. And one of those is an NFC championship where they just got boat raced by the time the first half was over. And that is a bit concerning. And part of this, frankly, is because this team is much better when they play from ahead and get into a rhythm early. If I were Matt LaFleur, I would not be kicking off to start the game when I win the coin toss anymore. Bar none, period, end of story. This is a this is a team that's predicated on the success of its offense. This is not a good defense. The defense more often than not allows yards and points to begin the game. Now the offense feels pressure to go back and get those points back, maybe not always playing within that initial rhythm. And then if they don't get the score and all of a sudden, we saw it exactly in this game. The, the Saints go down and score three points to begin with, drive down, score three points. Packers end up almost already on tilt. They went for it on fourth down deep in their own territory. They already are almost just like, we got to go get points. We like we can't let them have the ball back and score again. We got to go get points. They go for it on fourth down. Eventually, then they get a, uh, it was basically a three and out after they converted that initial fourth down, punt the ball away. Saints go down and score a touchdown. And now the, the Packers are completely out of their offense. That's got to be something that gets fixed. And to start the second half, I thought they did a little bit better job of maybe getting back in a rhythm before the Rodgers interception, but some major issues there. And Matt LaFleur needs to do a better job, and this offense needs to do a better job of figuring out how to play from behind. We saw it, the Chiefs Browns. Chiefs were behind double digits. They got some big plays. They got back in it. They never abandoned who they were. They kept being themselves, and they eventually came back and won that game against the the Browns. You know, they had the, the Packers really struggled in this game offensively on third downs, which was a huge indicator. They had the three turnovers. Rodgers had a 36.8 passer rating, including two interceptions, no touchdowns, only 133 yards. Nothing went right on offense. On defense, they could not win the line of scrimmage to save their lives. There were players on the ground. They couldn't set the edge. Z had that very blatant one where he couldn't set the edge. Linebackers were once again filling the wrong gaps. It looked very similar to the defenses that we've seen in the past. And it is time, and I said this just a few days ago as I was previewing this upcoming season, the Packers have got to find an identity for who they are on defense, because right now they are doing nothing well. They are not getting turnovers. They are not getting pressure. And I'm obviously going back to last season. We'll see what this season brings, but not getting pressure, not getting turnovers. They're not you know, bending, but not breaking. They're bending and breaking. They're giving up long drives, long possessions, keeping Rodgers off the field. And it's putting more pressure on the offense. There's not only is there no complimentary football, it's uncomplimentary football. The Packers offense isn't helping the defense. The defense isn't helping the offense. The special team certainly isn't going to save the day. So they just become this mess of three individual groups that aren't playing together cohesively as a team. And that's what we saw. And I think what's frustrating here is that while this is week one, all of the things that we've seen in bits and pieces and really come playoff time in, in those championship games that Green Bay has struggled with over, over the last couple seasons, those are the issues that we saw manifest itself today. The no showing for games, which we've seen in the past, the inability to convert uh, on third downs at times. We saw the defense just, you know, kind of giving up chunk yardage and big plays and just not being able to have any semblance uh, of stopping the opposing, like all of those things we saw kind of come to fruition in one game and build itself up to a complete blowout where the Saints won this game absolutely easy. So they need to find some sort of identity. And, you know, to go along with that, listen, 
if Kevin King can't cover some of those routes, if, if he like, I thought, I think it was Zach Cruz on Twitter that pointed out like Kevin King was like a four, three guy coming out. He looks like a four, six, four, seven guy right now. If he doesn't have that speed, like then it's time to go to Eric Stokes. It's as simple as that. Like Kevin King is not enough of a technician as a corner to just go out there and, and like be slower, slower than the opposing receivers. And he's like, he's never been one that's going to just cut on a dime. He doesn't have the agility. And you're like Matt LaFleur on multiple occasions this offseason said, Hey, when, when Kevin King is up there pressing and being aggressive, we really think that he can be one of the best corners. He's playing off coverage all the time. So yeah, you can say that, Hey, we really like this guy as a press man quarter. You're not playing press man coverage on defense. That's not your defense. So if, if he can't do that, if he's not the technician that you need in that sort of position, if he can't play your style of defense and you have a young corner who maybe is also not a technician at this point, but at least is a 4-3-40 guy who could maybe stick with the receivers that are trying to run past him, then to me, that's an upgrade and it's probably time to make a change. So those are my grievances, just to name a few on offense and defense in this game. Some other quick hitters that I want to go over, that Z roughing the passer penalty. Now, I want to be clear here. There is no, like, this is not an excuse for the Packers. Like, they got outplayed and outclassed in all phases of the game throughout the entirety of this game. One blown call by the official means nothing. And in fact, hopefully that the Packers got their big blown call with a turnover out of their system in a game they were going to lose anyway. But that is a completely insane call by the referee. And it's, it's basically to the point where if the quarterback gets hit hard, it's a penalty. Because that is as legal of a play as you could have by Zadarius Smith. Not around the head, not around the neck, uh, base, I even think like as he's like in midair, you can almost like see him grab his jersey and like try to hold him up. No weight landing on him. Like it is a textbook hit. And well, again, making no excuses. Like what if, you know, Savage houses that, right? Now all of a sudden it's what, 24 to 10? And it's still in the late in the third quarter? Like you never know how one big play might just sort of flip the script, right? And again, zero excuses. This is not an excuse whatsoever. Green Bay was going to lose that game no matter what. But like those big plays matter. And, and, you know, it would have been, frankly, the one thing Green Bay could have taken away from that game. Z had a nice pressure up the middle, leads to an interception by Darnell Savage, who has a nice return. Maybe they could have got something going on offense after that. And maybe you can take something away from the game. Instead, it's just a complete nightmare of a game altogether. And like I said, hopefully at least the, the Packers awful call that usually goes against them at least once a season. Hopefully they got that out of the way in a game they were going to lose anyway. We got to see a little bit of Jordan Love. Um, I thought that overall, it didn't look like the, you know, like anything was too big for him. I don't think you can glean too much because it, it wasn't real football, right? Like the Saints are just playing vanilla stuff at that point. Uh, but I thought he made a couple really nice throws. I th- actually thought the the cover two beater uh, to Alan Lazard, where Lazard had his hands on a little high, but like perfect placement in that position. Lazard just couldn't hold on. I thought he did some nice things, had the nice throw to Amari, the nice throw to Cobb. Um, Of course, had the turnover. Um, I think that's a really great opportunity to learn from that situation. And uh, again, he's pressured. He's just trying to make a play, whatever. I, I think in that situation, there's a bit more accident forgiveness, but a great situation for Jordan Love to learn from. So I guess maybe a, a very small positive in the fact of what Love was able to do when he got in the game. And again, that just didn't look too big for him and uh, was able to move the ball a little bit. So I think that's overall a positive. Um, you know, from a lineup standpoint, we saw a couple lineup things that we expected, but we kind of got confirmed, right? So Chandon Sullivan was the, the nickel slash slot corner. Henry Black was the dime safety. We saw uh, Devondre Campbell as the number one linebacker with Chris Barnes as the number two inside linebacker. We saw Rashawn Gary and Preston Smith start with Z being a little bit banged up uh, to begin with. Um, on the offensive side of the ball, we had Royce Newman start at right guard. Of course, uh, Meyer start at center. Lucas Patrick start at left guard. All of these things were expected, but we, you know, they weren't one hundred percent confirmed going in. Um, and those were the things that were confirmed. And then, of course, Kevin King over Eric Stokes at corner as well, which we will see how long that continues moving forward. A couple other quick notes. I thought this was a fairly uncharacteristic game from Matt LaFleur. Um, just even from a play calling standpoint, there was no rhythm uh, at really at any point, but two real weird things. So uh, late in the first half, uh, right before the the Saints scored their what second touchdown to go up 17 to nothing, they were stopped on third down and there was about a minute 50 left. And instead of calling their last time out there, 
they let the clock run down to about a minute and 10 seconds or a minute 17, I think it was. And then, you know, Packers get the ball, the, the Saints go for a fourth down, score a touchdown. Packers get the ball with a minute 10 left and one timeout, but they, they lost out on about 40 seconds by not calling a timeout uh, with, with the Saints having the ball because no matter what, right? If you might be like, well, they wanted to see what the Saints were doing, but no matter what, it, it didn't matter. The Saints kick a field goal and you get the ball back. The Saints score a touchdown, you get the ball back. The Saints go four and out, you get the ball back. Like no matter what happens, you get the ball back and you'd rather have time. There's no reason not to have the time in that situation. So I have no idea what happened there, but not calling a timeout was inexcusable. And quite frankly, it could have been the difference between three and seven points and maybe going down into halftime 17 to seven, because I think that extra time they were, they drove right down and Rogers would have had a chance to go in and, and potentially score a touchdown before halftime. Maybe that's a momentum switcher. I doubt it. Like I said, Green Bay was outclassed in all facets, but just another odd play um, in the game for the Packers and specifically Matt LaFleur. And then that play action on fourth and two, like it's a fourth and inches, fourth and one, like I get play action, but he goes play action power on fourth and two. And the defense isn't buying that. Nobody in the world was buying that for a second. Everyone in the world knew that they were going to put the ball in Aaron Rodgers' hands in that situation. So yeah, um, Mercedes Lewis slipped on the play. There's a guy waiting for him. There's a guy waiting for Devonta Adams because nobody in the world thought that they were going to run the ball in that play. So a very, just some odd play calls, some odd decisions, and just very uncharacteristic of the Packers and what we've seen from Matt LaFleur um, up until this point. Uh, real quick, some injuries, of course. Darnell Savage uh, looked like he got hurt on the interception return, which of course, even the good play ends up in something bad. Um, and then uh, he didn't play the very next play and then didn't return the remainder of the game. And then of course, Josiah DeGuara had the concussion as well. So Matt LaFleur said he would have an update on Monday in regards to those two injuries. If you're looking for any silver linings in this game, of course, the NFC North goes 0-4. Matt LaFleur is 6-0 in his career after losses in the regular season, winning most of those by double digits. Uh, the Packers are double-digit favor favorites going against the Detroit Lions in Green Bay this upcoming week. And uh, let's see, the Saints, oh, by the way, they won a game 38-3 to last year as well. The game they won 38-3 to week nine against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, who ultimately won the Super Bowl. So a 38-3 to loss against the Saints, far from uh, a death blow to your Super Bowl chances. In fact, the last time the Saints beat somebody 38-3, to they went on to win the Super Bowl. So some small silver linings there. And then I guess I'll just say, like sometimes it's good to get punched in the mouth. I think Green Bay was overconfident coming into this game, probably were feeling themselves a little bit, saying, hey, you know, we're automatically going to be a playoff contending team. We just have to show up and do our thing. The Saints said not so fast, and I think Green Bay will learn from that. I think they'll get over the adversity of a really tough first game loss. I think they'll get back on track against Detroit and then sort of right the ship moving forward. But uh, I, you know, it's it's all going to be how they learn from the mistakes from this game and make sure that it doesn't happen again. And we'll see how that goes moving forward. And hopefully, we have a lot more uh, post game fun um, and uh, being able to discuss wins moving forward rather than a game that was just ugly from beginning to end. That's going to do it for me. Thanks so much for joining me. Perry Goldstein and I did the audio version of today's podcast, just to give you an idea of how uh, the you know, Sunday went. Perry and I did the video as well, but the video did not turn out. So unfortunately, uh, we just have the audio together, but make sure to check that out because it's a great episode um, wherever you get your favorite podcast. But I'll be right back here tomorrow. And of course, until next time, and as always, Go Pack Go.